and basically uh, it's talking about how serious the problem was that there were people uh, looking for Ganyu, which is help or work, and that everyone doesn't have money to the point where people are so desperate, people are dying on the streets, where they will find anything they can, where these boys, or William, was eating goat skin, and that the situation has become so, so bad that people are walking for miles and miles and miles just trying to find something to eat. And William's mom has began making these small cakes to sell and to feed her family. Um, and that there was Christmas in Christmas, they usually have chicken and rice, but this year they had nothing. So William went to go find his cousin and they ate boiled goat skin. Chapter six, my school assignment. <clears throat> the following week, I was at home listening to the radio when I heard something better than any Christmas gift. The National Examinations Board has released the results of this year's Standard 8 exams, the announcer said. Remember, at his school, they do something called the Standard 8, where they uh, have all eight different subjects, and this tells them which, which high school they will go to. I raced into the kitchen to find my mother. My scores, I shouted. My scores are ready, so my results are ready. I took off running towards Wimby Primary School, leaping over stones and puddles along the trail, for once forgetting about my hunger. I wondered which secondary school, which high school I would be attending, Chayamba or Kazungu. Ever since I decided that I wanted to be a scientist, I knew these two schools were the best for me. They had the finest teachers, libraries, and laboratories where a science scientist could master his experiments. Of course, I didn't care which one I attended. Wherever those chaps needed me, I'd happily go. A group of students was already gathered outside the administration building. I pushed my way towards the front and found the list. The various schools were posted with their respective students slotted below. So it's a list of schools and what students will go where. I quickly found Kazungu and scanned the names. Nothing. Moving towards Chayamba, my finger scrolled over the names. Kalombo, Kalimbu, then Makalani. Wait a minute, I thought. There must be a mistake. Here you are, Kangwamba, said a boy named Michael, who was one of the best students. Your name is here, under Kachikolo. Sure enough, he was right. But Kachikolo Secondary was probably the worst school in the district. Like Wimby, it was just a community school and very poor. No science programs, no laboratories, no, no labs, just rain through a leaky roof. How can this be? I wondered. So he's the disappointment. He's not going to a school that's good. Then I saw the exam scores posted on the next board. Out of five subjects, I had only scored only one B. So A is the best, B is okay, C is not good, D is fail, basically, and E is terrible. I'd only scored one B in Chichewa, which was the easiest, which is their language. Everything else was marked C and D. I was going to catch Golo because my grades sucked. They stunk. My heart dropped in my stomach. I imagined the long walk to catch Golo, about three miles away. It was near a big tobacco farm. A river flowed nearby where Joffrey, Gilbert and I sometimes went fishing. The road was usually filled with mud, very dirty. Michael slapped me on the shoulder and laughed. <laughs> Congratulations. If anything, you'll become a great fisherman. The only good, the only good thing about Kachkolo was that Gilbert was also going. His grades stunk too. In any case, in two weeks, we would be walking along the same muddy road together. The new year arrived with steady rains that helped our mice to grow. The seedlings had sprouted well without fertilizer and they still seemed healthy. 
By now, their stalks were deep green, and they were up to my father's legs, his shins. The rains made everything come alive. All across the region, the flowers bloomed, and the forest and bushes and bushes blossomed. So there's lots of green everywhere. Everywhere you went, the land smelled rich and fragrant. It was all a cruel joke, of course, because nothing was ready to eat. So there's lots of flowers and bushes, but nothing anyone can eat. In the trading center, the businessmen raised the price of maize to one thousand kwacha per pail. The hungry people, who'd long ago turned to eating gaga, started getting sick when the traders began mixing it with sawdust. So remember, all these people are starving, hungry. They're eating anything they can find, and the people selling the maize are now mixing it with other things so that they can sell more. But it's making people get sick. When this was discovered, uh, that they're mixing the maize, an angry mob formed around the men. I spent all of my money only to get a bellyful of sawdust. One shouted, "My children are at home vomiting. You people are criminals." The hungry people could complain all they wanted, but with no money in their pockets, they had no power. Several resorted and went to do crime. One afternoon, my mother arrived as usual with her cakes and set up her stand. Within seconds, a crowd of people came around, shouting and grabbing at all of her things. "I'll take two," a woman said. "Give me three," said another. It, in this chaos, my mother didn't notice that others were stealing cakes from her basin and running away. One man grabbed three cakes, but instead of running. He sat down and ate them right there. Nine kwacha, my mother demanded. I don't have any money, he answered. That evening, when she returned, her hair was wild and her face was full of worry. They took almost everything, she said, and she was right. For supper, for dinner, there were only crumbs, so a tiny amount of food. As the price of maize continued to rise, my mother bought less and less flour. The number of cakes she sold began to shrink, and so did our nightly blob of insima. First, it was seven mouthfuls, then five, four, three. Every time you put insima in your mouth, add some water. She told us, that way you trick your stomach. At dinner, supper. We kids were careful about our portions. We wanted to be fair, but my sister Rose, who was seven years old, became greedy. Often she grabbed large handfuls of insima and stuffed them in her mouth before anyone could stop her. Hey, slow down! Shouted Doris, William's sister. Maybe you should eat faster, answered Rose. We were all becoming thin, especially the youngest one, like Rose. My parents never scolded her for taking more than her share, but one night Doris reached her breaking point. When Rose grabbed a big chunk of insima, Doris leaped across the basin and began punching her in the face. "Mama!" cried Rose. My mother struggled to pull them apart, then collapsed against the wall. "Please," she pleaded. "I just don't have the strength." That night we went to bed hungry again with the smell of food on our fingers, a smell that even the hottest water could not wash clean. The worst, the worse things got with the famine, the more I looked forward to school. Somehow, being hungry in a in a classroom full of friends seemed a lot easier than being hungry at home. You know, when you get so hungry, you get in a bad mood. As the big day approached, I tried my best to get ready. The first problem I encountered was my uniform. Back when we still had money, my mother had sent me to the used clothing stores in the trading center to buy a white shirt, so where people sell clothes that they don't need any more. Well, since my wardrobe only consisted of two shirts in total, I ended up wearing the white one a lot and got it dirty. Then we ran out of soap. Remember, there's no money anywhere. Back when the troubles began, we'd been using a bar of cheap Malua,、uh, Malui lye soap, which the whole family shared for bathing and for washing the clothes. 
When it finally ran out, we were too poor, too broke to buy another. We could wash our bodies with warm water and bangoi bushes, which is a type of plant, which acted like sponges. But a white shirt wasn't so easy to clean. I tried everything. I boiled it over the fire. I let it soak until the water was cool, then scrubbed until my shoulders were tired and sore. Nothing worked, so I started school with yellow circles around my armpits and a grey ring around the, col- the collar, which means it's sweaty, it's dirty. What could I do? That morning, I met Gilbert on the road, so we could walk together. Gilbert, bo, bo, sure, sure, fit, fit. My friend, this is the day we've been waiting for. Indeed, we should get ready to be bullied by the older boys. Yeah, I think so. Who do you think will hit us first? That's just it. If an older boy approaches us and he's not too muscular, I say we deal with him straight away. Good plan. So who should hit him first, me or you? Definitely you. What a weird conversation. The three-mile walk to Kachkolo took us over the hills and across the maize fields and past the dambos where we hunted as boys. Remember, they would go hunting for birds. That was in the dambos in the forest. The school sat in a valley surrounded by tobacco farms, where I watched tractors, so these big machines plowing a field, and the few lucky men with jobs enjoying a day's work. Once at school, we gathered it for the morning assembly. Our principal, Mr. W. M. Peary, who isn't the same guy that、uh, they were talking about earlier from, her fa- from his father's stories, stood before us dressed in a brown threadbare suit. He was an older man with a bald head, with no hair, except for a few grey hairs that grew around his ears. Mr. Peary started by saying how happy he was to see such promising students, and he was right. We were a good-looking bunch, and all of us were so excited to be continuing our education. In Malawi, which is the country they're in, secondary school was a privilege and an honour. In fact, I was certain that I was experiencing the greatest moment of my life. But like in any institution of learning. He said, "This school has rules that must be followed. Every student should be punctual on time and dressed in the proper uniform. If not, punishment will be swift." After assembly was over, I was talking. I was walking to class when Mr. Peary tapped me on the shoulder. "What's your name?" he said. I turned around and froze. "William Trywell Camguamba," I muttered. Unable to hide my nerves, he was nervous. Well, William, this is not the proper uniform. I threw both hands under my arms to hide my yellow stains, the dirt. But Mr. Peary was pointing at my feet. Sandals are not allowed, he said. We require students to wear proper footwear at all times. Please go home and change. I looked down at my flip-flops, which had seen better days. They were very dirty. The rubber connecting the sole was broken on one of the sandals, forcing me to carry a needle and thread in my pocket for emergency repairs. So his sandals are basically broken. I didn't have another pair of shoes at home. I had to think fast. Mister Headmaster, sir, I said, I would put on proper footwear, shoes, but I live in Wimbe, and we must cross. Two streams to get here, two rivers, and because it's the rainy season, my mother doesn't want me ruining my my good leather shoes in the mud. He scrunched his eyebrows and thought about it. He considered this. I prayed it would work. Fine, he said. But once the rains are over, I want to see you in the proper footwear, shoes. My parents did didn't have any money for school books either. In Malawi, the schools don't provide learning materials like they do in America. Even in better times, most students couldn't afford to buy their own books and had to share. At Wimbe Primary, that meant squeezing your bottoms together in the same seat and hoping your friend didn't read faster than you. 
Luckily for me, Gilbert always had his own books, and he allowed me to look on. The two of us even read at the same level. As I mentioned, the conditions in Wimbe Primary had been terrible. Holes in the roof that let in the rain. No glass in the windows to stop the cold winter wind. Lessons under trees. And of course, I told you about the terrible stories about the latrines, about the toilets. I was hoping for a better environment at Kuchkolo, but no such luck. When Gilbert and I arrived at our new classroom, our teacher, Mr. Tembo, told us to sit on the floor. The government sent no money for desks and chairs, he said, looking embarrassed, or anything else for that matter. Certainly not for repairs. In the center of the floor was a giant hole, where it looked like a bomb had exploded. The walls were chipped and damaged and coming apart. A cold breeze blew through the broken windows. And sure enough, when I looked up at the ceiling, at the roof, I saw a lot of blue sky, so there are holes in the roof as well. To my delight, Mr. Timber was a kind, soft-spoken man who was patient about problems and setbacks. Like most teachers in community schools, he lived in a small house next door with his wife and children. His clothes were old and a bit broken and ragged, and the small vegetable garden behind his house could hardly feed or sustain his family. But unlike the farmers, he received a meager salary that allowed for some extra grain during the hunger. Even still, I'd seen his kids in the yard before school, and their arms and legs were as skinny as mine, so even the teachers don't have money. Despite the poor conditions, Miss, <clears throat> Mr. Tembo wasted no time start, starting our lessons. Right away we began studying history, talking about early, early civilizations in China, Egypt and Mesopotamia. We learned about early forms of writing and how these cultures communicated with each other, so like a history or sociales lesson. I'd always had trouble in math, but I loved our discussion about angles and degrees and how to use a ruler to make measurements. I, rem <clears throat> I remembered hearing those words from the builders in the trading center. Just having a glass of water. One afternoon, we began our lessons in geography. Mr. Tembo pulled out a map of the world and asked us to find the continent of Africa, which was easy. Now, can anyone find Malawi? He asked. Yeah, here it is. We ran our fingers lovingly over our country. I couldn't believe how small it was compared to the rest of the world. To think my whole life and everything in it had taken place on this tiny piece of earth. On the map, the land was green and the lake appeared like a blue jewel, very blue lake. It was hard to guess that 11 million people lived in this tiny area. And at that moment, nearly all of us were slowly starving. That week, I'd realized I had been wrong. The hunger was just as painful at school as it was at home. All day, my stomach growled and gave my brain no peace and soon it was too difficult to pay attention. At first, my classmates and I were eager to raise our hands and answer one of Mr. Tembo's questions. A few of us even competed to be the first one. Come Gwamba here, over here, I would shout. But after two weeks, a silence fell over the room each morning and never lifted. Our faces became skinnier and thinner. And since we had no soap or lotions at home, our skin turned dry and gray, at like it looks like ash. During recess, a few of my friends simply walked off campus to search for food and never returned. None of this mattered anyway. On the first day of February, W.M. Viri, so the, the principal, made the following announcement at assembly. The administration is aware of the problems across the country, which we all face. But many of you still haven't paid your school fees for this term. Starting tomorrow, the free period is over. So imagine all these families that can't even afford food. They also can't afford to send their child to school. And the government doesn't help. So if you can't pay, you don't go. 
My worst fear had come true. I knew my father hadn't paid my fees, but who was I kidding? We were eating one meal per day. We couldn't afford to buy a bar of soap, much less pay twelve hundred guacha for my school. Walking home, I got mad at myself for even get for ever getting excited and coming in the first place. I had allowed myself a glimpse, a small feeling of the dream, and now everything was falling and crumbling around. What am I going to do? I asked Gilbert. I have no choice but to face the music. Don't stress, he said. Just go home and see what happens. When I arrived home, I found my father in the fields. At school, they're saying I should bring my fees tomorrow. Twelve hundred guacha, I said. So we should pay them. Mister Fury wasn't joking around. My father stared at the ground for a long time, then said, "You know our problems here, son. Right now we have nothing to spare. I'm so sorry." The next morning, I stood by the road and waited for Gilbert. For some reason, I still wore my school uniform, but I wasn't going any place. When Gilbert appeared and waved, I let him walk past. "What's the matter?" he said, turning around. "Aren't you coming to school?" I wanted to cry. "I'm dropping out. My parents don't have the money." Gilbert looked upset, which somehow made me feel better. "So sorry, friend." Hopefully they can find it. Yes, perhaps I said. See you later, Gilbert. I walked down to Jeffrey's house to Joffrey's house to give him the news. A few weeks before, he'd gotten lucky when a bolt of lightning knocked down a tree in his yard. He chopped it into bundles and sawed it as firewood along the road. It was enough to keep his family eating for a while, or at least I thought so. Joffrey was getting dressed when I entered the room, and the sight of him made me gasp. Like go, <gasps> he had lost so much weight. His eyes were sunken and dark, and the white parts of his eyes seemed to glow. This is what starving people look like. I thought they look like ghosts. Why aren't you in school? He asked. Didn't you get selected for Kachkolo? No money. Today I dropped. I had to quit. Oh, he muttered, then went quiet. Me and you were in the same desperate situation. I hope God has a plan for us. Yeah, I said. Me too. In the afternoon, I waited by the road to meet Gilbert as he walked home. When he saw me, he was shaking his head. Almost everyone dropped out. He said. Today we were few. Out of the seventy students, only twenty remained. What a sad way to end the chapter. So this 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 problem with the、uh, no food in the whole country is making people not allowed. They cannot go to school. They have no money. There's nothing they can do. So what a sad sad ending to chapter six.